start our uh, activity therefore welcome you all in this uh, first session uh, in our case based educational uh, series a lesson from a case uh, by the name of international league against epilepsy as the training region i am honored to welcome you in this first session uh, it is the first session really of a series possibly of a three to four uh, uh, <clears throat> of, during this year, the idea is originally uh, was delivered uh, by Professor Nermin Kish, who is a consultant neurologist and epileptologist uh, in Cairo University. Uh, she is an active member in the International League Against Epilepsy as the Tanner region, as well as an active member in the Egyptian League Against Epilepsy. Uh, the idea is really to present a number of uh, cases which may be educational, didactical, didactical, or maybe sometimes challenging cases. And then to discuss uh, those cases by an expert or panelist of experts to get uh, important uh, lessons from them. The, this session should be, uh, would be about the epileptic syndromes uh, with absence seizures titled Absence Caesar, is it always straightforward? The ILO, is, or I intended learning outcomes of this uh, session, would be to identify different absence seizures phenotypes, say typical absence with or without automatism, uh, absence with eyelid myoclonia, myoclonic absence seizures, atypical uh, absence. And to differentiate absences from focal, non motor, of course, and aware seizures. And choice of the suitable anti seizure medication, taking in our consideration puberty issues uh, and the quality of life. And to identify different etiologies and its impact on treatment and the prognosis. Our expert guest in this session is Professor Ahmed Abdul Mati. Uh, Professor Ahmed Abdul Mati is a professor of Child in Neurology at the University of Missouri at Kansas. He is Vice President of Clinical Access, Associate Chair, Department of Pediatrics, Director, Division of Neurology, and Chief Session of Epilepsy and the Clinical Neurophysiology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. Welcome to Dr. Ahmed, and thank you him in advance for accepting our invitation to uh, be the expert of the first session and our activity. Our presenting positions will be Dr. Muna Kamil, Dr. Amani, Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Al Shayma, and Dr. Professor Nirmeen Kish. Well, I am inviting now Dr. Muna to start her first and second uh, cases in this activity. Dr. Muna, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Gaib, to present me, and I'm very honored to be part of uh, today's meeting. Uh, next, please. Next. I'm going to present my first case. She is a female patient, eight years old, right-handed. She was born to non-consanguous parents with relevant perinatal developmental and medical history. No family history of epilepsy or history of febrile convulsions with good scholastic achievement. Next, please. She presented to us to, with uh, recurrent attacks of arrest of behavior, head turned to the left side and abnormal movement around her mouth and both hands. She started at the age of six years. Her seizure frequency were five to seven times per day. Next, please. Normal general and neurological examination. Next. This is a video of her seizures. As we can see, she was hyperventilating then suddenly turned her, her head and neck to the left. We switched movement around her angle of the mouth with automatic hand movement bilaterally. Then she ended her seizure and turned it back to her consciousness. Next. As we all know, 2017 classification of seizure types as a focal onset, generalized onset, and unknown onset. Now I would like to know your opinion. Next, please. What's your clinical diagnosis of her seizures? Is it generalized onset, 
focal onset seizure, psychogenic non-epileptic, or movement disorder. Paul, please, can we start the poll? Can you end it now? Okay. As we can see, 57% of our attendees said it's a focal onset seizure and 42% said it's generalized onset. Only 2% thought it's psychogenic and none of us thought it's movement disorder. Next, please. So I would like also to know your opinion. What would be the best next step to confirm our diagnosis? Routine EEG, MRI, video EEG, or refer to psychiatrist? And can we start the poll? Can you see the results now? Okay, 66% chose to start with a video EEG. Okay, next please. Her video EEG. It's a video EEG, showed the video with the EEG charges. As we can see, with the start of her seizure, she started to, to, to develop a 3 hertz spike and slow waves, generalized during the seizure. Next, please. This is a 20-second epoch showing the whole seizure, as well as we can see the 3 hertz spike slow waves. Next, please. So after we have seen the EEG, what would be your opinion, her diagnosis? Typical absence, myoclonic absence, atypical or frontal loop absence. Can we start support? Okay, can we see the results? Okay, 56% chose typical absence and 25% atypical absence. Okay, next. So, we started the patient on isoxamide 20 milligram per kg per day and her seizure were controlled based on the studies that compared isoxamide, valproic acid and lamot regime. That showed that isoxamide and valproic acid were better on seizure control. However, isoxamide were better than valproic due to the attention uh, affection caused by valproic acid. Next, please. I will leave you now with our expert to comment on our case. Well, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Well, first of all, I'd really like to thank the organizing committee um, for this really, really great um, exercise, great symposium. Um, it is very important to look at the different um, aspects of any seizure and any epilepsy. And um, as everybody here knows, that seizures um, in any form of epilepsy falls under a spectrum. So it's never going to be a one picture. It's never going to be a snapshot. A lot of times it's a story, so which highlights the importance of this activity that the uh, the ILAE is doing in the Middle East to, to kind of bring the different spectrum and, and level set this. Um, this is a really good and a very common occurrence in the neurology clinic. Um, you'll have a, a parent or you'll have a child who has some arrested behavior, um, sometimes with some automatism, uh, either through 
uh, lip smacking or, or math automatism, sometimes with a hand movement, that can sometimes have a little bit of a focal feature to it. So it's very interesting if you look through the different questions here. The first question, some people thought might be focal, might be generalized, might be a movement disorder, or might be something else altogether, might be something psychogenic. But as Dr. Mona sh showed us some, some more information, then we started thinking, okay, well, I need an EEG to be able at least to know what department I'm in. I'm in the epilepsy department, um, then I can decide if it's focal or generalized, um, or am I in something else other than epilepsy? And after we looked at the EEG, we thought, well, okay, now I know I'm in the seizure um, uh, uh, department, and I know because it's a three hertz spike and slow wave, 56% of the people said, well, it is a generalized, which um, I totally agree and I totally concur that that's, that, is the, that is the case in this case. So what about that focal um, head deviation or focal eye deviation? Um, as we all know, as long as it's not always on towards one side, which happens in roughly about 40% of, um, of typical absence, there will be some head or eye deviation to one side, either left or right, as long as it's not always committing to one side, number one. And as long as my EEG is not showing any focality to it, um, then I'm still in the generalized epilepsy form and I'm still based on that uh, on that young lady's age. She's eight years of age, so she is a, a, a childhood absence epilepsy. So the history here really helps me a lot. It's telling the whole story, which I can never tell it by just the history. I can never tell it by just the EEG. And I can never tell it even by the, by the medication response because sometimes, um, even in, in, in generalized epilepsy, they might respond to some of the broad spectrum anti seizure medications or anti, anti epileptic medications. So, so really knowing that or getting the whole uh, story, which I think that's the point of this, of this case here, it has some confusing or some atypical features of a very typical syndrome where this eye and head deviation, as long as it's not happening consistently to one side, if it happens left and right, right and left, number one, um, my EEG that shows the three hertz, which is the very typical signature of the, of the childhood absence epilepsy. And lastly, the response to ethosexamide, which still, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go, it's still the treatment of choice. Um, the study that Dr. Mona showed, the multi-center study, and we were, we were um, honored to be one of those centers here at, um, at Kansas City, looking at the different seizure medications for absence epilepsy, still highlighting that ethosexamide and valproic acid are the two best seizure medications for absence epilepsy, regardless of the other seizure types the patient might have, which means, as we know, sometimes patients with absence epilepsy will have absence myoclonus or might have a generalized tonic-clonic as well as their absence. That still made that ethosexamide is the best treatment from, a, from an efficacy and tolerability standpoint. And at the same level of efficacy was valproic acid, but of course, we all know what kind of potential side effects that can happen with valproic acid. I think that's a really good case that can show the spectrum and the importance of getting all the pieces without just making a decision based on only a video, only the EEG, or only the response to the medications. Can I add something, Dr. Ahmed? Hello? Can I add yeah. a something, uh, if, you, if you allow me? Uh, we are speaking some uh, about some uh, uh, possibly a mildly atypical presentation of the of absence seizure in this uh, particular patient. Uh, but I want to mention the concepts of the simple typical absence and complex typical absence. Uh, simple typical absence when there is only eye blinking, which will we see it in the juvenile absence uh, epilepsy, while the complex a typical absence where there is some nystagmus, say, some deviation of the head or eyes to one side, some a head mo uh, movement, a myoclonic event, uh, we usually see in uh, childhood absence uh, epilepsy. Uh, are you with me in this in this uh, statement? So um, there definitely, um, um, I agree with you 100%. There is a spectrum of presentation. Um, as we all know, um, the ILA E um, classification from 2017, which Dr. Mona uh, shared with us, uh, we have the typical, atypical, um, the eyelid myoclonia, and the myoclonic absence seizure type. So, um, which patient, wh well, I guess, which, which type do I put this patient under uh, out of that classification? I would put her under the typical. Because again, we'll talk about the atypical here um, in one of the upcoming cases. So even though I agree with you 100%, um, 
um, the presentation is not the the um, the median of the type of presentation. However, if I were to fit it in one of those ILE classification, I would put it under the typical because it's the three hertz spike and weight. It does start with the arrested behavior. Um, and again, as we agree, if there is going to be a little bit of eye deviation to the right sometimes, to the left other times, as we all know, it, that that depends on the on the epileptogenic networking, how it's going to spread sometimes it might actually project um, a little bit to one side more than the other, but that does not defy the fact that it's still a generalized and it's still a typical type of um, type of absence. As we'll talk, the atypical absence, it's mainly an EEG finding, um, which in this young lady, she had the very typical classical three hertz spike in weight. Well, thank you. Uh, Dr. Mullah, can you can proceed? Okay, thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for your comments. Now I present my second case. Next, please. Our second case, she is a female presented to us at the age of eight years old, right-handed. She also was born to non-consanguous marriage with Irrelevant past history apart from neonatal jaundice at the age of three days without any complication. Normal prenatal developmental and medical history, no history of family, no family history of epilepsy, no history of febrile convulsions, with adequate scholastic achievement. Next, please. Okay, our patient presented at the age with, a, with an onset of her seizures. At the age of five years old, she reported the recurrent falling without any convulsive phenomena. At the age of six and to seven years old, she started to develop realized tonic-clonic seizures were, were infrequent with the last attack at the age of seven. During our follow-up, she started to develop at the age of nine years recurrent attacks, arrest of behavior, jerking movement of both upper and lower limbs without any post ictal confusion. Seizure frequency was three to five times per day. Next, please. This is a home video. She was talking to her family, to someone as a member of her family. Then suddenly she showed arrest of behavior, jerking of both upper and lower limbs, mainly in the upper limbs. It continued for more than 20 seconds. By the end of it, she resumed her activity and reading what she was reading. Next, please. Normal gender and normal neurological examination. Next. Also, we all know 2017 classification. I would like to know your opinion. Next, please. About her seizure type. Can we describe it as clonic, atonic, tonic clonic? Myclonic or psychogenic? Can we start the poll? Okay, can we see the results? Okay. Tonic clonic, 39% choose tonic clonic, 34 choose clonic seizure, 19% choose my clonic seizures, and 9% choose, uh, choose uh, psychogenic seizures. Okay, next please. So, according to your choice, what would be preferred the next step we do? Video EEG, video EEG with additional polygraph. Standard EEG with hyperventilation or standard EEG with spotic stimulation. Can we start the poll?
Okay, let's see the results. Okay, most of uh, our attendees either choose video EEG or video EEG with polygraph. Okay, next. We proceeded for a video EEG with a polygraph. We inserted an EMG needle at her deltoid and recorded her seizures. As we can see, three hertz spike waves started to show with EMG burst sync in uh, coincide with her spike slow wave and her clinical jerks. Then at the end, everything stopped. Okay, next please. This is a 20 second epoch also to show the three hertz spike slow waves with the AMG uh, burst, muscle burst at, uh, as we can see in the epoch. Next please. So after we see the whole data, what would be your diagnosis? Can we still support? Okay, can we see the results? Okay, 37% uh, of our attendees choose Lennox Gusto, 23% choose Javons, 20% choose Tazinari, and 20% choose Do syndrome. Okay, next. Let's hear our experts comment on this case. So that's another really interesting case that's, um, <clears throat> again, as you can see through the answers of the questions, um, as people learn more about that, that young lady, um, they started making up their mind. So um, first of all, I, I guess if, if we can take it by exclusion, can this patient have Lennox-Gastaut syndrome? So Dr. Mona mentioned something very, very important that will make Lennox-Gastaut not a possibility, even though she does have more than one seizure type, which is the normal development. So I cannot have normal development with lennox gastaut syndrome, <clears throat> as we all know. We know that we can have some um, other associated seizure types with absence epilepsy, so I can have myoclonic seizures. Now, if the hallmark of the epilepsy is myoclonic and the EEG shows me the four to six hertz polyspike and slow wave, I'm more thinking of a juvenile myoclonic epilepsy type of patient. But if my EEG is showing me three hertz spike and wave, and the hallmark of my epilepsy is absence, then yes, it can happen with some myoclonus um, at some point, um, and even some generalized tonic-clonic, as we saw in that young lady. Um, we all know that up to 40% of patients with absence epilepsy can have generalized tonic-clonic. That does not change the diagnosis, it just makes, makes it another, um, another entity of that, um, of that absence epilepsy. What about Javon syndrome? Um, and I think everybody on this call knows very well that Javon syndrome, it's typically gonna be eyelid myoclonia, mostly in the eyes, um, and it's gonna be mostly um, provoked by photic stimulation. And even typically the EEG will have that posterior or that um, uh, parieto occipital predominance, as opposed to the, the usual absence epilepsy that typically will have that frontal lobe, high voltage, three hertz or lie spike and wave. So the more posterior I get, the more myoclonia, especially with the eyelid myoclonia I have, and the more I have that, that, that three hertz spike and wave, because remember, those patients are going to have both the absence as well as the, the, um, the myoclonic seizures. Can this be a DOSA syndrome? So DOSA syndrome, by definition, it's the atonic myoclonic. So we did not see any atonic seizures. Um, and typically, the DOSA syndrome patients are going to be slower spike and slow wave. So that kind of further falls under the atypical absence because of the slow, um, slow spike, slow wave, typically one and a half to three, oh, sorry, one and a half to two and a half hertz, slow spike, slow wave uh, that, that are gonna be more likely to be with the, with the DOSA syndrome. So again, by exclusion, it cannot be uh, Lennox-Gastel because of the, the normal development, 
It is not a Doza syndrome because we do not have the, the atonic myoclonic, even though the young lady does have the myoclonic. However, the, 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 does not have the atonic phase of it. Then what do we have that with the Javon syndrome? I do have the eyelid myoclonia. Uh, typically those patients will have some of the posterior high voltage predominant um, uh, spike or, or sharp and slow wave activity. And it usually will fall in that in that three to four hertz uh, uh, range. So um, th this, is, this is another really good case of one of your typical absence types or one of your typical um, um, uh, absence myoclonic types that can fall under that, under that wide range of, um, a, uh, of um, absence and myoclonic seizures. Well, Dr. Ahmed, you put uh, juvenile myoclonic, I, I think, and in, in the start as a differential. I think there's a big difference, you know, I, I know you are, uh, you know that it is a big difference between the, the two, because, you know, ju juvenile myoclonic abscess have no long absences like this one, and have no, uh, and have no long uh, series of jerks, unless if it is, uh, uh, it is not uh, status, myoclonic status. So there is no, no place, I think, to put juvenile myoclonic epilepsy in this. Oh, I, 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 to, I totally agree. I totally agree. And, and, and the reason I mentioned juvenile myoclonic, because the patient has myoclonic epilepsy, but also to mention that this cannot be juvenile myoclonic epilepsy because the EEG does not agree. Typically, EEG of juvenile myoclonic epilepsy are going to be the high voltage four to six hertz. This was a three hertz. So typically four to six hertz polyspike and slow wave. That's from an EEG standpoint. Number two, to your point, typically the myoclonic twitches, which typically happens first thing in the morning, that usually is the um, is the hallmark, which is going to be very short and brief. The other part is the age. So that young lady was five years of age, which is completely outside the juvenile myoclonic epilepsy range, even though, yes, can you see juvenile myoclonic um, epilepsy as early as seven, uh, eight, seven to eight years of age? Yes, you can but it has to meet all the other criteria. The, 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 the rapid myoclonus that typically happens first, first thing in the morning, the EEG finding with a high voltage 46 hertz poly spike and slow wave, which is very different from this young lady's EEG. So what would I put this young lady with? Again, she still meets the criteria for absence with a three-year spike and wave. She does have absence eaters, but she also has that prolonged myoclonus with it. About the age, do you agree with me that the age is really practically not a differentiating factor? Yeah. In this case or in others. You so know, there is always a, a range of age. Absolutely, uh, everything, everything is a spectrum. So whenever we mention, spectrum. yeah, whatever we mention an age, that's typically the, the median um, of, of the occurrence of it, but it can happen as early as, again, I've seen juvenile myoclonic epilepsy as early as five years of age, and I've seen it as late as 21 years of age as the very first initial onset. Typically it's, if we're talking juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, which is not this case, typically it's anywhere between um, 12 to 16 years of age. But to your point, yes, absolutely. You can absolutely have a wide range. And whatever we mention the range age, typically we pick the median or that middle of that bell curve. It's reported up, up to 29 years of age. Absolutely, 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 yes. But so here's the thing though, um, sometimes the patient will present a little bit late. And I think that's a really good point that you bring um, because sometimes the patient might present late, not because the seizure just started, because the family have been ignoring it, have not been paying attention to it, or the yes, patient sometimes it's a mis right. Right. Yes. So, yes. so if I see, if I see, um, for example, if I see um, a childhood absence epilepsy, which is not uncommon, if I see it at the age of fifteen, um, it still could have been happening. Which, which really brings the importance of taking the history, because sometimes, as we're taking the history. Um, we find that, oh, this, those seizures have been happening for three, four, five years. It's just the family haven't paid attention to it. Yes, you are right. M missed seizures uh, is always uh, found. Absolutely. Especially with myoclonic, absence, uh, spasms. Those are the type of seizures. Everybody's going to recognize the generalized tonic-clonic seizures, but not everyone will recognize the absence seizures. They are very subtle. They're very short. The patient bounces right back to what they're doing. So there isn't much of a post ictal change, so it can easily be missed in up to 80%, actually. So some of the, um, some of the case series uh, showed that patients or families can, can miss up to 80% of, um, of absence either, which also brings the importance of follow-up um, uh, clinically. And so um, how the patient is doing in school, uh, what the EG looks like. So 
uh, we all see it all the time that the family will come and say, great, the medicine is working perfectly fine. We're not having any seizures, but you check on the grades, the grades at school are still bad. You repeat an EG and you see a lot of subclinical seizures or a lot of brief three to four second seizures, which might not be picked by just looking at the kid, but with, uh, with taking the clinical history, the development hasn't caught up or the, or the academic performance hasn't caught up and the EG still shows the seizure. That's when I, I know that there's still work to be done. Yes, you are right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Muna. Uh, I think we are going on now to the third uh, case. Uh, Dr. Amani, professor of clinical uh, neurophysiology, will present to us the third uh, case. Dr. Amani, please. Uh, greetings to you, Professor Ghaib, and uh, to the international media against SDSC. Uh, greetings to Professor Abdul Mati and Professor <laughs> And greetings to all attendees. Uh, this uh, child is, five, is a five-year-old male. He's right-handed, born to non-consanguineous parents, normal perinatal developmental and medical history, no family history of epilepsy, and no fam no history of febrile convulsions. Next, he uh, presented uh, by daily attacks of arrested behavior without motor seizures. Next. He has normal and uh, normal general and neurological examination. Next. Uh, his interictal EEG shows a burst of the generalized spike and wave complexes of about three hertz frequency. Next. Uh, this are, uh, these, this slide and the next will show the onset of his uh, uh, arrest of behavior seizures. We can see that they show uh, generalized uh, spike and wave complexes at uh, uh, three hertz frequency. But please note uh, at the onset of the seizure, note the right frontal derivations in this slide and the next slide. Next, please. Uh, at the two slides, we can see that the ictal onset, uh, there is a persistent synchrony, the right side leads. And this is this asynchrony as well as asymmetry has been described with generalized seizures. Next, please. Our question to our expert, uh, are there any red flags in the EEG that would point out towards that such finding, such a synchrony or asymmetry is an actual underlying focal pathology rather than a finding that may be seen with generalized epilepsy? And of course, uh, if we uh, report this abnormality or this focal uh, abnormality in the record, uh, how does this impact uh, have on the referring physician uh, in terms of further investigations, provision of treatment, and problems. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Armani. That's a really interesting case. And uh, this, a lot of times, <clears throat> can pause um, the clinician, can, can really cause a little bit of a dilemma in the, in the neurology clinic. Um, um, and that's another example of the importance of putting all the pieces together. I cannot only take the clinical history, which is the most important part, uh, away from the EEG, from the exam, from my neuroimaging. So it all has to really be fitting together. So in that young um, um, uh, man that you showed the EEG for, um, there is persistence of that predominance or that uh, leading of focal activity that's happening. And that cannot be ignored. So if I look at my um, interictal EEG, uh, my interictal EEG shows me that there are some persistent interictal spikes or sharp waves uh, over that um, right, uh, right hemisphere, number one. Number two, um, even the seizure that you showed that clearly has that right hemispheric lead to it, even though very shortly after that, within less than a second, it becomes a generalized high voltage three hertz spike and wave, but I do have that lead and I cannot ignore that lead. But the other part is the asynchrony or if there's any asymmetry in the, in the amplitude between the left and the right hemisphere. So I have, even though the seizure semiology is an absent seizure, but everything else, everything else electrographically is pointing me towards it being a focal, a focal seizure. There's actually a very nice case series by Elaine Wiley from the Cleveland Clinic. And we actually included um, a series of patients with 23 uh, patients from my center. Uh, that presented with absence epilepsy, absence seizures, but ended up having an epilepsy surgery with a resection of, a, of epileptogenic tissue that was deep enough that by the time it made it all, all the way up to the cortex or all the way to the scalp, 
it seemed to be generalized spike in weight. So if I have if I have clinical and or focal features on the EEG that points me towards focal, I need to take the next step. I need to look a little bit deeper um, because there is definitely a possibility that this can be a focal seizure that presents itself in a generalized fashion. How do I know that? Sometimes there are clinical clues, uh, but also the EEG clue like this case, which is a really, really good case to highlight, to highlight that. Now, let's, let's take a moment and differentiate between fragmentary bursts and focal discharges because fragmentary bursts, by definition, those are going to be small bursts that might happen in different parts of the of, of the brain. So it's going to be on the right frontal, left frontal, left and right temporal. It's going to be occipital. It's going to be all over. It's going to have the same morphology. And actually, towards the end, I'm going to show you some examples of fragmentary bursts. It's going to have the same morphology. But the most important part, it's going to be scattered all over the EEG. I'm going to repeat, it has to be scattered all over the EEG. If I find that my interictal discharges are only happening in one area, that's a big red flag. I am dealing with a focal seizure. And what you're seeing here is not a generalized spike and wave. What you're seeing is a bilaterally synchronous or rapid bilaterally synchronous uh, discharge. And there's a big difference between the two. The first one, the generalized discharge, it means that it starts generalized. It starts, it has the same start. It has the equal synchrony as opposed to bilateral synchrony, which is the secondary bilateral synchrony, I have a spark or I have a spike that, um, that very rapidly picks to, to, to cause that generalized discharge. And that's a completely different, I'm talking now a focal, focal epilepsy, I'm talking a focal, focal seizure because of that secondary. And the key thing is the secondary, secondary bilateral synchrony, which is what Dr. Amani showed us, as opposed to the initial generalized from the get-go generalized spike and weight. So two things. The interictal EEG, if it shows me the persistence of the activity in one focus, number one, or it shows me the, um, the asynchrony or the asymmetry, number two, those are all focal findings. The third part is, as Dr. Amani showed us, into the seizure. There is a definite focal lead that happens towards that before that generalization. So that's 100% a focal seizure that presents like an, like a, like an absence seizure. How do I know that? By the EEG that tells me the rest of the story. Uh, thank you. Can I have uh, some uh, comments? Uh, this is a, a big question, really, Dr. Amani. This is this uh, usually a usual finding. Sometimes we come across a lot of cases where it is a typical absence by the clinical picture and by the video, and sometimes even in the front of the physician. Still, you have uh, some uh, say uh, uh, not an abrupt onset. It is. It is not an abrupt. But I don't agree with you that this this particular case it is a, fo a focality. Here I think it is uh, not a focality, but it is not some sort of asymmetry between the right and the left side. The point is, if we find we find non-localizable onset, this in favor of generalized non-localizable onset. In this particular case, the onset is generalized, but it is not from the start spike and wave. It is a from it was only slowing, but it is a general change. If you if the picture can be uh, uh, restored to us now, Doctor Gaz, if it is possible to see uh, the there is an, a generalized abrupt. You see here there is a generalized abrupt change, but it is not spike and wave from the start, uh, and it is uh, of abrupt onset, but it is only a change in the usual EEG. Later on, and what say, as you said, in one or a, a less second, it will change to a spike and wave. Uh, sometimes we can go uh, in this cases to the offset. The offset will be uh, abrupt. This will be in favor of the generalized. But what I want to to uh, uh, to say that this. You know, the EEG one it is on the head, on the scalp EEG. Uh, this is, uh, scalp EEG sometimes uh, cannot be very oriented to all the uh, activity. You know, these scissors, uh, the scissor, which is uh, maybe different from the scissor, which coming after, say, uh, one minute or, or five minutes. Uh, the scissor are not the same. They are not stereotyped. I mean, the generations of neurons which are sharing with this, uh, with this uh, 
Caesar are different from the generations of neurons in the second one. And the e scalp EG sometimes not, uh, not oriented from the start to all the neurons which are sharing this particular, uh, this particular change. It may need a few minutes, a few seconds, I mean, or a part of a second to be oriented at the right and left uh, uh, side. This is one. The second point, this can be seen even uh, in focal epilepsies. You know, in focal epilepsies, you find a very, fine, a very clear focality in the in OREG, and it is focal by clinical and by EEG, et cetera. But you may find that during the, the whole EEG, you may come across a strain or say a short run of EEG, which is of abrupt change, and possibly uh, not usually it is uh, not abrupt uh, of, uh, offset, but it's abrupt onset. The explanation is again the same, uh, that this uh, activity comes to be oriented to the EEG in the skull only when it was uh, generalized, but it is pri primarily was uh, uh, focal. Uh, just to say to, so it is some sort of orientation by the, by the skull, uh, age. As you said, it is the big clinical picture. It is the to see to see the whole series of uh, ages. If we, uh, we if we find the persistent fatality in this picture and the second picture uh, together with the clinical, clinical picture, we will go then to the focal side. So I think Dr. Raib really brings a really good point. Um, and here is here is the tiebreaker, or here is the 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 way to kind of look at it. If it's an alternating laterality, meaning that it happens a little bit on the right side and a little bit on the left side, I 100% agree. This is a generalized and can be generalized because you're right. Sometimes you have a little bit of a lead on one side, but if this is alternating left and right, then yes, this can be generalized. If it's persistent, which I think this is the case, Dr. Dr. Uh, Mona and uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Amani showed us this, this picture here from one seizure and the one before from another seizure, both of which has um, to my eyes, pretty clear lead. Yeah, there you go. So you have this clear leading. So let's not start right at the generalized spike and wave here. Let's take the second before. So you see that leading theta slowing with the intermixed um, moderate voltage, sharp wave, uh, sharp and slow wave activity that's leading into the seizure. That, that's a focal onset. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that, that there, is no, there is no doubt about it. And, and even the next page tells it a little bit better. But even as you go through the seizure, so if you go into like the fifth or the sixth sec second of the seizure, notice the, the amplitude difference and even the asynchrony. If you draw a line, you'll see that the, that the right side is leading by almost like a less than 200 milliseconds than the left side. So you have the asynchrony, you have the asymmetry, you have the persistence. And again, I really want to stress on the persistence. Look, I agree with you 100%, Dr. Raab. If it's happening a little bit on the right and a little bit on the left, I'll take that as, as generalized with alternating laterality. You can absolutely have alternating laterality. But if it's always persistent on one coming out of one side, I need to look a little bit further into it. I need to get my MRI. I need to look for focality because I, by the time, if I have a deep focus, if I have, let's say, a, a, a mesial occipital or even a mesial parietal focus that's causing my seizure, Remember, through the corpus callosum, through the anterior and posterior fasciculi, I can have that rapid spread to both hemispheres to look on the EEG to be that to be that generalized. We all know this, that the scalp EEG will give me six millimeters below the, the surface, right? So that's the best I can do with my surface EEG. So by the time things make it all the way to the surface, it can look bilaterally synchronous. The big question is, did it start bilaterally synchronous or did it become secondary bilaterally synchronous? In generalized epilepsy, it all starts bilateral synchronous. And that's why it will look like that on my EEG. It might be left and right, and that's okay, I'll take that. But if it's persistently happening with that leading, then I, I, wanna, I wanna at least explore the possibility. That's the patient that I'm gonna do. The three Tesla MRI on, that's the patient that I might wanna consider the addition of a second medication. Usually those are the ones, by the way, um, which, which is not uncommon. You give them the FSXMide and they typically do not respond to your FSXMide because it is not your typical Epsilon seizure. And that's another clue. So if I don't get it, which is fine, it's okay. Sometimes we might not get it 
in the first clinic appointment because I, I, you know what, it might be a, a little bit lateralizing here. I might not capture as many seizures from one EEG and I might start the atosuximide. But when the patient comes back to me in the next clinic visit and, I, and there's no improvement and the EEG looks the same, that's a big red flag now. You know, if I didn't catch it the first appointment, I should be able to catch it as they fail the atosuximide. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed for this. Thank you, Dr. Amani, for this nice uh, presentation and nice uh, question, really. Uh, we are going now to the fourth case, uh, will be presented by Dr. Ahmed al consultant in neurology uh, in Cairo uh, University. Dr. Ahmed. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, uh, Professor Ghaib. Good evening, Professor uh, Ahmed Abdel Mouti. Lael is a female patient, 13 years old, right handed. Her perinatal developmental family and past medical history were irrelevant. Uh, she had recurrent attacks of bilateral tonic clonic seizure in clusters. Her seizure started at the age of 13 years old four months before first encountered to our clinic. <laughs> Next. Next. According to her serial semiology, she had a diurnal cluster of, no, no, to the previous one, please. She had a diurnal cluster of bilateral tonic clonic uh, seizures. Her parents also reported that she had frequent blinking and unresponsiveness for several hours then she developed bilateral tonic clonic seizure. Sometimes it's long, it is as long as 24 hours before developing tonic clonic seizures. According to her seizure frequency, she had a cluster of generalized tonic clonic seizure about uh, two, every, once every two weeks. Uh, she had also frequent blinking and arrest of behavior daily. Uh, her seizure were precipitated by sleep deprivation. She had stents epilepticus once every one to two weeks. Uh, she had a poor memory and the cognitive uh, function. She was on levetiracetam and lamotrigine. Next. Her examination was unremarkable. Next. According to her AEG, the background was normal during wakefulness and during the sleep, as we show in this background. Uh, next. According to the interictal ability form it charges, she had abundant generalized spikes, poly spikes, and poly spikes to wave complexes, 3 to 3.5 hertz. During wakefulness, these were induced by eye closure most of the times. Next. If we look to this a book of EEG, we will see eye closure, then generalized poly spikes, slow wave charges. Next. This is video EEG for eyelid myclonia. We could see eyelid myoclonia following eye closure associated with generalized poly spike slow waves. Next. Also, here in this uh, video, the patient developed eyelid myoclonic status epilepticus that lasted for one hour, and it was provoked by playing in her mobile phone. This eyelid myoclonia was associated in some instances with absent seizures. We could see here blinking and eyelid myoclonia. Next.
at the end of eyelid microlonic states of lip crust, she developed generalized tonic clonic seizure. We could see here eyelid myclonia. Then the patient will have generalized tonic clonic seizure. Like this. Her MRI was normal. Next. Like In our patient, what is the type of epilepsy? Juvenile myoclonic, juvenile absence epilepsy, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, Lennox Gastaut syndrome, Jevon syndrome. Next. Fifty-seven percent vote to Jevon syndrome, then juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, then uh, juvenile absence and Lennox Gastaut. Next. Valbronic acid was added gradually up to 250 milligram twice daily with adjustment of lamotrigine dose. Then levetiracetam was gradually stopped. Our patient is seizure free for four months right now. Her cognitive function and the memory showed mild improvement. Next. We need uh, your comments on the choice of valproic acid in adolescents and how we balance risk benefit of valproic acid. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. That's a really great case. And, <clears throat> and if you look at, um, at the choices and the, the multiple choice, uh, could this be Lennox Castillo? Could it be juvenile absence epilepsy? Could it be uh, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy or Javon syndrome? All of the above can have myoclonic seizures. So let's walk a little bit before we answer the question on the screen here. Uh, let's walk over the diagnosis and see what's, how can we come to that to the diagnosis. So first of all, and again, remember we cannot take one thing and make the decision based on it. We have to take everything in together. So this young lady, Dr. Ahmad told us that she has normal developments. I have to keep that in mind as I'm looking and 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 deciding is it Lennox Castillo or not. Number one. Number two, what did my EEG show? Did my EEG show? Uh, slow spike, slow wave, or my three hertz spike and slow wave, or poly spike and slow wave. Number three, what is the hallmark of the seizure? So the hallmark is uh, is the myoclonic. So even though this patient had all three types, you had the absence, had the myoclonic, and had the generalized tonic clonic. Which, if we think about it, my absence patient can have all three, right? So twenty percent of patients with absence epilepsy can have generalized tonic clonic. We just talked about absence epilepsy can have um, absence myoclonus. So that's, that's, but what's the hallmark here? It's the myoclonic. Where's the myoclonic happening? It's happening in the, in the eyes. How is it happening? Mostly with visual stimulation. And that's, that's another big clue for Javon syndrome as patients are having the, the visual stimulation, a lot of times with photic stimulation being on the, on a screen um, and so on and so forth. So it cannot be Lennox Castillo because Dr. Ahmed told us her development is normal. Plus her EG background was normal in between seizures anyway. So that's one. Is it juvenile absence epilepsy? Um, the hallmark here is the eyelid myoclonia. So it cannot be the juvenile or the childhood absence epilepsy, even though it would not be a wrong answer if the main type of seizure are the absence with a little bit of myoclonus here and there. But that's not the case in that young lady. It was mainly uh, the myoclonic part. Now, what is the best treatment for, uh, for, uh, for absence myoclonus or for juvenile uh, like we agreed, for absence in general, it's ethosuximide and, and a valproic acid. When, it, when I see the myoclonus, whenever there's more, mostly myoclonus, it's valproic acid. Valproic acid has been actually introduced in the United States since 1974. Um, it is approved for both generalized and focal adjunctive um, uh, 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 epilepsy. 
it it has a lot of benefits um, as far as controlling seizures, and it can come with uh, with side effects. So the main side effects that we all worry about are sleepiness, right? So that's some of the common side effects. Sometimes balance and tremors. That's another common side effect. The less common side effects, but they can scare us, are the weight gain, the polycystic ovaries, the um, the pancreatitis, sometimes thrombocytopenia, or even aplastic anemia in less than one percent of the patients, as well as liver failure or liver problems. So we have to balance things. So um, valproic acid is, is a great treatment in a patient who might benefit from, from that treatment. So I can try with an ethosuximide, but as I fail it, or even lamotrigine, as I fail that treatment, my next medicine to go to is immediately going to be valproic acid. I have to balance the risk-benefit ratio. Yes, there is a price for any medicine I, I use, but what's the benefit? In this case, valproic acid benefit outweighs the risk. And that's, and as Dr. Ahmed mentioned, that patient became seizure-free. So yes, she might be uh, having a little bit of a increased appetite, which might increase her weight. Um, she might have a little bit more uh, risk for, uh, for, uh, uh, for weight gain and a little bit sometimes in some patients with behavioral changes. Um, I can deal with that. Now, if this is a, if this is a patient who's like um, uh, 23, 24, got married and is planning pregnancy, that's a different story. I have to look at that and I have to look at other options like lamotrigine, which is the medicine that's been most widely um, tested and, and tried in, in pregnancy, some of the other medications, but I cannot keep someone on, on valproic acid while they're pregnant. Anybody, especially females uh, who are gonna start on, on valproic acid, as long as they're in their teens, um, we simply uh, help uh, supplement them with folinic acid uh, just again, as if they're planning pregnancy or if she's married, even if she's not planning pregnancy, but she's married, um, we always start them on high dose fo folic acid to make sure that we, we balance that or offset that, um, that, that, that risk. So I, I agree, this is a Javon syndrome. Uh, typically the EG is a little bit more posterior, like we mentioned, it's my three hertz spike and wave. It can have the generalized tonic clonic, it can have the absence, but the hallmark of the, of the seizure is the eyelid myoclonia mainly with, uh, with visual stimulation. And valproic acid is the treatment of choice for that young lady. Uh, well, Dr. Ahmed, about the lamotrogen, uh, uh, I think it uh, sometimes may aggravate uh, G-Vons. Right, so, so in some, and actually in any myoclonic epilepsy, mm -hmm. in any myoclonic epilepsy with few exceptions, like juvenile myoclonic, it is actually one of the initial treatments. Um, but, um, but lamotrigine can aggravate um, myoclonic seizures in, in some patients. However, in patients who, and there's actually um, a big study by Tracy Glauser, the one that, um, or a follow-up study for the one that Dr. Mona showed us here, is actually looking at uh, different medications, including uh, lamotrigine for juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, as well as, a, as, well as absence myoclonic seizures, where uh, there's actually a pretty large subset of patients that might benefit from it. So I agree with you. For Javon syndrome, it is not my first choice. I was talking in general about pregnancy in, in, uh, in epilepsy, that lamotrigine is the medicine of choice. But for Javon syndrome, valproic acid would be my, my choice in some cases as a second choice, um, levetiracetam uh, or even toparamate as a much, much lower, a lower option. But option number one will always be valproic acid for Javon syndrome. Thank you very much. Thank you. We shift now to the fifth uh, case with uh, uh, Dr. Al Shayma uh, Uthman, lecturer in, in neurology, Cairo University. Please, uh, Dr. Shayma. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, now, and now let's go a little bit atypical with this male patient, 20 years old. Uh, he's a right handed and he's a healthy product of consanguineous marriage with uneventable perinatal history. He has positive family history of epilepsy in paternal cousin, and he have global developmental delay. Regarding his seizures, uh, he had febrile seizures since the age of two years old and through four years old. And then he had multiple afebrile uh, polymorphic seizure types in the form of epileptic spasm, tonic seizures, absence, generalized tonic clonic, and the atonic seizures. His seizures were both sleep-related and occurring also during wakefulness. And they were all drug-resistant with multiple seizure types and the longest seizure-free period of 10 
days while on multiple anti-seizure medications. Uh, let's go, let's see one of his seizure types. Okay, apart from mental subnormality, his neurological examination, general examination, and the MRI brain were unremarkable. And now let's see his seizures. Can we go next, please? This is a question for all of you. Can atypical absence be subtle, particularly in patients with pre-existing cognitive impairment? Let's start the poll. Well, uh, more than 90% responded yes, which is very true. So let's go the, to the seizure types of these male patients. This is the first seizure where the patient was drowsy. And then he developed this subtle eye deviation, this blinking. And unfortunately, awareness was not tested during this episode. And then he gradually returned to the baseline. This is another seizure type. Can we go to the next one, please? This is another uh, seizure type which occurred during sleep. The patient was sleeping and then out of sleep, he developed this stiffening of both upper limbs with some vibration overlying and the EEG is showing fast activity, generalized fast activity. So if we put all of these together, can we go to the next slide, please? And based on his clinical neurophysiological data, the most likely diagnosis is Dravet syndrome, Lennox Gastaut syndrome, Landau Kleffner syndrome, or juvenile absence epilepsy. Well, 57% uh, have voted for Lennox Gastaut syndrome. And now let's, let's have the opinion of Dr. Abdelmati and Dr. Gaib. So this is actually one of the most underdiagnosed um, syndromes in epilepsy. So to walk, to walk together over the main key features of that young man. Number one, he has developmental impairment or developmental disability. Uh, number two, um, which is again, reflected very well on the EEG with the slow background of the EEG. So that's, that's very, very clear from the, from the EEG. The second part is that he has multiple seizure types. So as Dr. Um, al Shaima told us, he had history of, uh, uh, epileptic spasms, um, atypical absence, and we'll come back to atypical absence here in a minute, um, had, as we saw in the video, the very clear tonic into tonic-clonic uh, seizures, has history of myoclonic seizures. So, so we have developmental impairment, we have um, multiple seizure types, and the third part, and I think everybody got this question right here, third part is we have slow spike, slow wave, 
What does slow spike slow wave mean? It means one and a half to two and a half hertz spike slow wave um, in a focal or in generalized fa fashion. In this case, it was clearly generalized bilaterally synchronous fashion. So this patient for the first seizure um, had arrested behavior, had um, a, a staring, was not paying attention. So it's a form of absent. Is it typical or is it atypical? That's when I go to the EEG and my EEG tells me that's the slow spike, slow wave, less than three hertz. In this case, it was two and a half hertz. And that makes it a slam dunk that that's an atypical absent seizure. So I have atypical absent seizure. How do I know it's atypical? Because of the slow spike, slow wave, uh, number one. Clinically, patient is slower to respond. And we'll talk about that um, in, a, in a minute here. Uh, slower to respond. The EG evolution might be a little bit slower. Um, you might see a little bit of focal slowing after after it's over, but it's overall um, clinically and electrographically atypical seizure. So anytime I have those three things together, developmental impairment, and I'm using the term impairment, not disability, because sometimes the impairment might not be all the way to the level of disability. What does that mean? I might have a patient with an IQ of 90 which by definition does not qualify for, in, for disability, but that's an impairment. They need to work extra hard to get a, a good grade. They need to spend more time at work to get to the same result. They might need to have a certain repetition of the same thing for them to understand it. So that's an impairment, not disability. And there's a big difference between the two. So if I have development impairment, two or more seizure types and slow spike, slow wave on my EEG, those three things, just made the diagnosis of lennox gastaut syndrome. That's exactly how Lennox and Gastaut described their syndrome, that it has to have those three criteria. There's a one little, little caveat to this. About 80%, 8-0, 80 80% of patients will lose the slow sp spike slow wave as they get older. If you follow most pediatric age group patients uh, with slow spike slow wave, as they get into their 20s and 30s, they, they no longer have the slow spike slow wave. So it's very important to keep in mind that I, I keep that in mind as I'm diagnosing my patient with lennox Castell, And that's exactly why, as I mentioned, it is one of the most underdiagnosed um, syndromes of epilepsy because people are looking for everything in those triad. The patient has to be wheelchair bound. The patient has to be nonverbal. The patient has to be severely disabled. Absolutely not true. Um, the, as long as the patient has the developmental impairment, they can be walking, talking, holding a job, even married, uh, but they cannot perform the job um, as um, their peers would do, and they have the multiple seizure types and the, the slowing or with the slow spike, slow wave on the EG, that's exactly what makes the diagnosis of Lennox Castell. Well, uh, I, I agree with you, Dr. Ahmed, that it is a very underdiagnosed uh, uh, diagnosis. Uh, our physicians really uh, never think about uh, Lennox Castell, and if they do not see a tonic seizures with the trauma, with the fractured nose, with fractured teeth, with the blood coming from the right and left, they will then go to think about Linux, the Gastel. A lot of patients who are submental, say, uh, with a long absence status, yeah. a typical absence status, which are uh, underdiagnosed and passed uh, as, say, some cognitive uh, decline and, and, and so on. Uh, uh, that is one. That's the third, second thing I think about the uh, atypical absence. If you want to comment to about typical and atypical absence, Dr. Ahmed. Absolutely. So, um, so before I comment on the typical and atypical, because I think you bring a great point, Dr. Ghaib, that um, drop attacks. We have to remember drop attacks had not been part of the ILAE definition since the 60s, 1960s. So there isn't such a term. I agree 100% with you. Sometimes people will misunderstand the term drop attack and think it's synonymous or equal to atonic seizures. And absolutely that is not the case. So the American Epilepsy Society defined drop attacks as any seizures that did lead to or could have led to the patient dropping to the ground. What type of seizure make me drop to the ground? Any type of seizure. Atypical absence, I can drop to the ground. Focal seizure, yes. Clonic, tonic, myoclonic, at atonic. So any seizure type that can or could have made me drop is considered under that umbrella. So it, it, the patient does not have to have it does not have to have atonic seizure form to be called uh, um, Lennox Castell. The EEG finding, and that's a that's a really great point. Um, 
I'm going to show some slides toward the end, um, the difference between typical and atypical absence. So there's a lot of controversy in the literature. Let me start by saying that uh, between what is typical and what's atypical absence. But the consensus is it's an EEG finding. If my EEG from the start is showing me that I have the slow spike, slow wave, two and a half hertz or less, that's an atypical absence. That always is associated with the clinical finding of a lot longer um, uh, recovery. Sometimes it's not as abrupt of an onset, so the patient might ease themselves into the atypical absence as opposed to the typical absence. The patient can be in the middle of a sentence and automatically will stop, then come back in three to four seconds later to talk. Atypical absence, it's a lot slower going into the seizure and slower coming out of the seizure. But again, the main differentiating criterion is the EEG. If the EEG is three hertz spike and wave, generalized, frontal dominant, the whole criteria, that's, a, that's typical. If it's a slow spike, slow wave, two and a half hertz or less, that's an atypical absence. Yeah. Uh, the, the point is that which, which made this picture to differentiate is easy. Uh, other than EEG, is that the atypical absence never comes alone. Uh, it is always with other type of seizures. Uh, on contrast, the typical absence, which can come uh, just typical absence, so there is uh, no much uh, pro uh, difficulty in, in differentiating between them. I think the difficulty or the challenge is to differentiate uh, typical absence from uh, uh, unaware, focal, unaware, uh, Non-motor seizures. This is the problem which we really, with the physicians, meet uh, uh, daily in their daily work. And a lot of uh, patients who are treated, uh, say, as uh, focal and aware uh, non-motor seizures, after years, they will be discovered to have uh, just childhood uh, absence epilepsy or typical uh, absence seizure. This is the because why? Because the two patients, the unaware, focal unaware, and the typical absence are normal person, good cognition, uh, efficient people. They can be, you know, uh, even any type of work or on their usual life. On contrast to the atypical case where he is usually with cognitive decline, with other type of seizure, etc. So that, that's a really other good point, Dr. Raib, and I, I, I agree with you. Um, the, the only thing that I want to highlight here is um, your DOSA syndrome, the, the, a, the, the, the myoclonic atonic, formerly known as aesthetic myoclonic. Patients can have a completely normal development, and yet their seizures are atypical absence in that case. So patients with DOSA syndrome will have a normal background, can have a completely normal development, early on at least, um, with DOSA syndrome, uh, or DOSA, as some, some places might call it. Um, and yet this is an atypical absence because it's always the slow spike, slow wave are the, are the, the, um, the slow wave. The other thing to it, which is, which is um, I agree with you, atypical absence typically never comes on its own. Usually it comes as a package with other seizure types, um, either at the same time or history of, like in this young, young man, had history of uh, spasms, does have history of, uh, of generalized tonic and tonic-clonic seizure. So it's, it's unlikely for atypical absence to come by itself. 100% agree with you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaima. Uh, and we now proceed to the last case. Uh, Dr. Professor, Dr. Nermeen, please. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, everyone. First, I, I would like to, uh, to thank Professor Ghaib, Chairman of Executive Board of uh, IRE uh, East Mediterranean Region, and all the board members uh, for their support to start this activity. Uh, and uh, really special thank to Professor Ahmed for accepting our invitation to the first epilepsy case-based educational series. Uh, our patient, uh, a 15-year-old male patient, right-handed, non-consanguous student, Regarding his family history, his younger brother was diagnosed uh, with a childhood absence epilepsy at the age of six, but was fully uh, resolved by the time uh, he was nine. Our patient uh, has non-eventable prenatal developmental history, nor any history of febrile convulsion. He has low scholastic achievement due to his illness. Next, please. 
He presented uh, at the age of 12 uh, with the recanted cake of arrest of behavior, lasting for a few seconds, up to 20 times a day. Uh, he was diagnosed with typical absence seizure, uh, and ethoxamide was added uh, with no marked improvement in his seizure frequency. The next, please. So after taking uh, a more detailed history, uh, um, we found out that at the age of two, uh, just after weaning, her mother reported an attack of transient eye deviation. Uh, and then at the age of um, nine to, uh, to 12 years, uh, typical absent is started to uh, notice by the mother. Uh, and as I mentioned, we start uh, at the age of 12, uh, isoxamide. Uh, by the time uh, of 13, he developed a uh, generalized tonic clonic seizure. So, uh, Valproate and Lamotrigine were prescribed through next six months. Uh, unfortunately, the seizures were not fully controlled. Then, he developed the first status epilepticus, uh, and this, um, this attack occurred after a normal school day. Uh, the patient uh, had uh, skipped her, his breakfast and had performed a vigorous exercise before uh, starting uh, such a status uh, epilepsy. After su uh, such a status, uh, libertaricitam uh, was given as a loading dose and then added on the previous uh, and seizure medication. Next. Uh, in spite of his condition, uh, he has the normal general and neurological examination. Next. And this clip uh, uh, for a video, actual video EEG uh, uh, from our uh, EMU, uh, we recorded a tech of um, actual event, uh, arrest during hyperventilation, patient developed uh, sudden onset, sudden offset, rest of, uh, of behavior um, with uh, mild uh, eyelid uh, twitches. Uh, and this is con um, associated with the ictal uh, uh, three spike here, um, with uh, uh, changes in on the EEG as you see. Yeah. Patient is first arrest of behavior and then became communicating after uh, such attack. And this attack lasting uh, for five seconds. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, 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 the patient, uh, the patient uh, is continuing on four, in spite of the use of four anti seizure medication by the full dose, uh, still has a weekly absence seizure, uh, while the GTCs uh, occurred twice monthly. Next, please. So at this stage, in your opinion, what is the next step? Revising the history again, MRI, C protocol. A genetic testing or a change in medication is what? Okay, uh, most of the attendees uh, choose MRI bliss protocol, gen, uh, then genetic testing. And we already uh, revising the history when the patient is not controlling uh, on the first and seizure medication approximately. Okay, we can, next please. Uh, we already, uh, as I mentioned, revised the, the full history of the patient. We perform an MRI epilepsy protocol according to the ILE recommendation. And uh, we found there is a dilated third ventricle, as you can see on the left side of the screen, T1 coronal section, and on the right of the screen, clear uh, coronal section with decrease, uh, with volume decreased on Salomon. Please. So, Based on uh, the clinical, radiological, and the neurophysiological finding, most likely uh, diagnosis or cause of the manifestation, hypoglycemia, ring chromosome 20, GLUT1 transporter deficiency, or lens gastro syndrome. Please vote.
Okay. Okay. Uh, most of uh, our attendees uh, um, uh, choose uh, the most correct uh, answers, group one transport deficiency, and we, we will see how we uh, move this. Please, next. Uh, in a nutshell, regarding the clinical uh, EEG and MRI, we found that the clin in the clinical aspect, uh, he has a positive uh, uh, he has a post, uh, post the family history of uh, generalized, genetically generalized epilepsy. Uh, the second has an early onset absence seizure with other type of seizure, uh, which fulfill the definition of drug resistant epilepsy. It has a learning disability, and the most of the GTCs trigger by fasting and exercise. Uh, uh, and uh, while the, the EEG has a generalized two and uh, two to four hertz uh, spike slow wave, uh, MRI is normal. So on, on this, uh, uh, on the clinical EEG and MRI finding, uh, we can suspect the crude one uh, transporter one deficient syndrome to be um, suspected. Well, as regarding our suspicions, please answer the next question. Uh, the rate of glute transporter one deficiency in early onset absence seizure is closest to which percent? Please vote. Okay. Let us see. Uh, most of our attendees. Uh, the correct answer, which is 10% of, uh, of, uh, of 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 patient, uh, is has a good one deficiency uh, presented with uh, early onset absence. Uh, so move to the next slide, please. To confirm, uh, to uh, to make uh, to confirm our suspect suspected diagnosis. Uh, CSF serum glucose ratio uh, measured, uh, but be aware that the blood sample should be obtained from the patient before doing lumbar puncture to avoid stress-induced hyperglycemia, which subsequently falsely increase CSF glucose uh, level. And uh, as we can see uh, here, normal uh, um, normal fasting blood sugar. Uh, however, there is low glucose uh, CSF. Um, uh, 49 milligram per liter, and the ratio uh, was uh, low as 0.4, as the normal is 0.6 or more. Next, please. For more documentation, we proceeded uh, by performing uh, genetic testing, DNA sequencing uh, for SLC A1 uh, gene, which encode team for trans membrane uh, transporter, and we found that our patient has a missense mutation, uh, which result on a limited glucose availability uh, in the brain and lead to cerebral energy deficiency. Next, please. So, which is the best first line of treatment based on the previous uh, information uh, you were here? Please vote. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, when we uh, confirm the diagnosis of GLUT1 uh, transporter deficiency, uh, the most uh, the first uh, line of treatment ketogenic diet. So next uh, slide, please. We, st we start. Uh, we start the diet therapy, referring our patient to our clinical nutritionist, uh, and the ketogenic diet was started to maintain ketosis without weight loss. As regarding the anti-seizure medication regimen, we reduced in number and the doses over three months after initiation of ketogenic diet. Um, the seizure frequency and severity were decreased by 70% after starting the ketogenic diet, and also the scholastic achievement quality of life were improved 
uh, markedly. But the case is still remaining uh, challenging, uh, even after uh, diagnosis. It is hard to control such uh, a young gentleman right, uh, on a long term. So I, I need to comment uh, from um, our expert, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you. Um, so I think that's a really great case, Dr. Nermeen. I, I think it, it brings uh, a lot of very important points. Um, number one is anytime we we'll start seeing absom seizures, I, and I and I I know that this was realized a little bit a little bit into the process, but uh, anytime we see absom seizures uh, or atypical absom seizures under the age of four, uh, we start immediately thinking of GLUT1 transport deficiency. So this is one of the very common causes of absence seizures under, under uh, four years of age. It's okay that sometimes we might not uh, get it from the first uh, go, even though um, taking the history and going over that, that should help a lot. But as the patient is failing the medication, that's the second station or that's the second time that we have the opportunity to, to say, you know what, time out. Why is my patient not responding to the treatment? What am I missing? What happened? And that's when I go back and get the history, as you mentioned. And it's, um, I realized that, oh, when he was under four, he was having some of those staring with some eye deviation. He was not really meeting all the, all the developmental milestones. And that's what makes me think, okay, so I have two things now. I have seizures and absence under four years of age, number one. Number two, I have drug-resistant epilepsy that is not responding to medications. And that's exactly what we expect from, uh, from GLUT1 transport deficiency. Next one is, okay, what do I need to do to confirm that? Um, the less expensive method is uh, spinal tap. The more accurate and a little bit more expensive method is the genetics. And as, as you mentioned, bringing both kind of brings, brings closure. Then uh, you start the, the ketogenic diet, which is the treatment of choice for GLUT1 transport deficiency. We got to keep in mind that the longer I wait to start that um, fuel or that energy uh, uh, replacement for the brain, the more likely my long-term um, cognitive and quality of life issues can be lower. So patients that we identify early on and we start ketogenic diet on, as they get older, typically by 16-ish or so, we can actually switch them over to modified Atkins diet. So that's that's a lot less restrictive, but it still allows for the for the for the high fat content. If we all remember, um, up until roughly about eight to 12 years of age, and it's a big range because um, this is where the myelination, this is where a lot of the, a lot of the different uh, developmental functions happen, where about two thirds of the brain metabolism is coming from ketone bodies. My acetoacetic acid, my beta hydroxybutyric acid, and my acetone. So, if the, if the brain is missing those pieces and it's missing the glucose because of the, glu the, um, the GLUT1 transport deficiency, then the most critical per period of a patient's or a child's life is being deprived of energy to the brain. And that's where I see the most um, quality of life and the most developmental disability later on. So the earlier I introduce my ketogenic diet, the better my uh, long-term outcome is. And um, we all, I'm sure you all have patients, and I do have a number of patients that we started ketogenic diet as early as the first year of life. And those patients tend to have an almost completely normal development. So it's a very key and important thing, the timing of the diagnosis, because that can make a big difference down the road as far as, um, as, far as the therapy. As the patient starts to become 12 to 16, now I don't need as much ketones for my brain energy. That's when I can switch a little bit over to to modified Atkins, which is a lot more doable than, than a strict ketogenic diet. Dr. Ahmed, about the absences uh, in uh, uh, glucose transporter one, uh, what I know is that it is a typical type of absence, not typical type of absence. Absolutely, 100%, absolutely, yes, sir. 100% atypical, yes. Oh, that's what, uh, uh, because I think Dr. Nermin uh, spoke about typical, I, I, I understood something like that, that it is typical abscesses. I think it is uh, one of the uh, diseases which are associated with, with atypical absence, like others, like Du syndrome, say, and uh, uh, 15 micro deletion and et cetera, uh, and, yeah. and the glucose tolerance uh, one, uh, yeah. transporter one. Right, so so I, I, actually the, the way I understood it that um, 
he might have, uh, his brother had typical absence, but he himself had atypical absence. So, mm -hmm. so which, is, which is another thing, you know, honestly, I, if we dig a little bit into, into the brother's history, it, I don't know if it's going to be the typical absence with the, with the T-calcium channelopathy or another, another form of uh, a missense mutation. But yeah, what I understood is that um, he had, he was diagnosed with typical, but he actually had atypical absence. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rini. Thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you. Ahmed. Uh, so, well, now we will shift to uh, the lecture of uh, Professor Ahmed about the approach to uh, Caesar with absences. Dr. Ahmed, please. Thank you so much. Well, I, I really would like to thank the organizing committee again, and um, Dr. Ghaib and definitely Dr. Nermeen for putting a lot of great effort. Uh, first, I think this is a great. Uh, opportunity for um, for friends and experts and colleagues to get together and, and go over um, a very important topic. And I, 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 I love to be um, part of your upcoming um, case here because I think that this is very important as we share our uh, combined expertise and combined um, experience here. Um, so let me let me address it from a little bit of a practical approach here. So um, and hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, OK, let me. Let me make sure I can blow it up. You see my screen okay? Okay. So I want to approach you really from a, from a practical approach. Ahmed, can you put it on the presentation? Um, let me see here. I'm not sure why it's not. You see it okay now? Um. Um, okay, let me see what's happening here because do you see it now? Yes, very good. Okay, is my slide advancing? Okay, you may see, you see you should see my second slide now, correct? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I want to take a little bit of a practical approach here, and I know this is this might be um, um, somewhat basic, but very important. And I know um, my colleagues and friends on on this call here are aware of um, a lot of that. So, um, as we agreed, this is a, it's like telling a story or reading a book. I cannot make up my mind about what's this book about until I read the last page. I cannot I cannot pick some chapter in the middle, or I cannot read the first half of the book and be able to write a, a criticism of what the book is talking about, what's it, what's it about. So it's very important to take that, that full, full approach. One of the very important approaches is actually getting a good history about that type of staring. Um, what, when does it happen? Does it happen only at school? Um, uh, is it associated with hyperactivity? Am I thinking of an ADHD here? Does it happen only on the weekends? Um, does it happen in the morning, first thing in the morning? Does it happen at night before the patient goes to sleep? Because all of those are clues that might direct me to my syndrome or what type of what's, got, what's happening here. In addition to that, is it a form of inattention or arrested behavior? Um, can my patient remember what's being said? Do they know what's happening around them? Are they completely oblivious to what's going on? What other associated symptoms? Are there myoclonic twitches? Are there generalized tonic-clonic? Which we know can happen in about 20% of patients with generalized with, with absence epilepsy can have generalized tonic-clonic, which does not change the diagnosis and should not change the treatment either. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute here. My developmental history is gonna be very important because like we agreed, typically, um, or the majority of typical absence will happen with normal development. So if I have developmental disability, or if I have developmental impairment, I need to start thinking, is it really an absence seizure or is it something else? Is it an atypical absence? Is it a focal seizure? What's, what's happening with me here? Then part of the exam, and yeah, you know, someone, especially first time in clinic before they start any medications, um, the quick hyperventilation can be very, very good tool to allow me to see the event in front of me. Um, if someone is not treated, and I'm not sure, is the mom and the dad describing an ADHD or are they describing absence? Having that rapid breathing for about two to three minutes might allow me to know what's going on. But my exam as well, if my exam is showing focal findings, especially in patients with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, patients with um, post-stroke, patients with um, 
uh, metabolic and, and genetic disorders? Am I seeing a, a, a focal finding? In which case I'm thinking this might be a focal feature of a seizure rather than a generalized um, absence epilepsy. So that young lady here, um, she's doing the hyperventilation. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So as you can tell here, um, I mean, obviously we have to be a little creative. So, so we, we give them this pinwheel to, to blow at. And you notice the technologist, once uh, that lady, she stopped uh, uh, blowing, she had an arrested behavior. She had uh, a little bit of eyelid myoclonia with it. Then after that, the technician started saying one, two, three, four. Sometimes they'll say different things like apples, banana, elephants, uh, cats, dogs. And the reason for that is after the kid starts waking up to ask them, what did you remember? Sometimes they'll say, you know what? You said seven, eight, nine. So they missed one, two, three, four, five, six. And the only, so we can tell, and obviously on the EG, you can tell exactly how long has it been. So this is your very typical absent seizure that you see uh, on a daily basis. Okay. Let me show you another young lady here. So notice those tonic gaze deviation with a little bit of a myoclonic twitch with it. And he goes right back to what he was doing. So the first one was your typical absence. And this is absence with eyelid myoclonia and with, uh, with tonic uh, uh, um, up gaze. Very brief. Most of those, by the way, are not noticed by the family unless the kid is doing something or engaging in an activity. They're not going to be able to tell what's happening. And here is your signature. Those, um, this is that three hertz uh, frontal dominant generalized spike and wave as it starts through the seizure. And notice how the seizure ends. It ends abruptly. The seizure does not have a tail to it, so it ends abruptly. And you have the EG going back exactly. Look at that posterior dominant rhythm. Very nice posterior dominant rhythm goes right after that generalized spike and wave. So here's your high voltage, three hertz uh, um, uh, spike or sharp and slow wave. And it, it starts abruptly. Notice this at the beginning, you don't have any lead to, you don't have any, any uh, focality to it. And at the end, it ends very nicely abruptly as well. This is what we talked about. So sometimes you'll notice this in a, in a patient with absence epilepsy, you'll notice fragments. Notice how those fragments over the right frontal, over the left frontal, you notice it even posteriorly here, they have the exact same morphology. They have different distribution. So it's a left and right, frontal, posterior, it's all over the place. And it's the exact same distribution. So if you notice, it's almost like I took one of the spikes. Like if I take one of those, if I take it, this one here, if I take it out and place it in a different part of the EG, it's gonna be this guy. It's gonna be this one. It's gonna be this one. It's gonna be this one. So those are fragments. So those are described and not multifocal, uh, this multifocal spikes, not to confuse it with the focal feature. So those are fragments, which are little pieces of the generalized discharge. And those are 100% part of the generalized. It does not change my diagnosis, does not change my treatment, does not change anything because they have the same morphology. They are not happening persistently in one area. Like in Dr. Amani's patient, the patient had discharge happening only in one focus. That's different. Here I'm talking fragments that's happening all over the EG, and those are typically perfectly fine to have. So just to kind of put it together, here's my typical absence that we've been talking about for the last hour and a half. It's an abrupt onset and offset um, of, uh, of alertness and of EEG. The memory is preserved before and after, so I don't have any um, impaired memory before and after, but I do have impaired memory during that event. It can be as short as three seconds, right? And as long as, it can be as long as it want to be. So um, and I want to make sure that this is, uh, again, for it to be, uh, if, it, if it's only electrographic, it has to be a, a minimum of three seconds. But it can, if it's clinical, it can be as little as one second or even less than that. Not infrequently, it can be associated with the myoclonic. And we talked about that, the absence myoclonus. Typically, it's in the eyelids, eyelid myoclonia, sometimes in the head with a little bit of head bobbing, or even the eyebrows um, and the chin. You'll see some chin quivering as part of the automatism. Uh, with chin and, and, um, and facial myoclonia. Um, you'll have automatism either in the hands or sometimes in the face, oral and manual oral stimulation. And of course, it has the very unique three hertz, not slower than three years. If it's gonna be typical, it must be three hertz, three to four hertz typically is the range for it. Okay, 
So here is a different beast. So this is an ictal EEG. Before I go over the ictal EEG, notice how the background is even slower before I even went into the EEG. So to Dr. Ghaib's earlier point that usually um, atypical absence, usually, not always, but usually atypical absence happens in a patient who is developmentally impaired with few exceptions. And we talked about Doza syndrome, that's, a, that's an exception. But count with me here. So this is one, one and a half, maybe two hertz. So this is one and a half to two and a half hertz, slow spike, slow wave seizure. So this is definitely my atypical absence. So how, how did I know it's atypical? Purely from the EG. If it's less than three hertz, it becomes an atypical absence. Another example here of two and a half hertz of atypical um, absence. And again, the eyes will go up and you, the patient might have a little bit of interruption in the middle. And this is another feature of atypical absence. You notice the sharp and slow wave and a little bit of interruption, because remember, those patients will ease themselves into the seizure. And same thing after the seizure. Remember the other kid that I showed you, the seizure ended and the EG went back straight to its baseline. Here, there's a generalized slowing after the seizure ends. So it's not abrupt ending like the typical absence. This is an this is a, a, a gradual return back to the baseline, not like the, the typical absence. So again, less abrupt onset and offset, um, again, often associated with uh, other features, uh, typically other uh, seizure types. Uh, the patient will slow themselves into the seizure, either will slump, will fall gradually, they might fall completely. Remember, we just talked about drop attacks. It can be a typical absence as part of the, the drop attacks as well. Um, the loss of awareness might be very, very minimal, uh, but those are the patients that are likely or are more likely to go into atypical absence status because, because of the, the nature of their underlying ideology. And again, as we agreed, the EG is typically slower. This is the hallmark of atypical absence. So what do I do? So let's, let's talk a little bit practically here. So I have someone who comes to my office with staring, um, with or without eyelid myclonia. I'm going to get an EEG. I'm getting out one of three things. Either the EG will be normal, it might show me focal findings, focal interictal or focal ictal if I'm if I'm if I'm lucky, or generalized spike and slow wave. So let's take each one at a time. So if I have generalized spike and slow wave with a normal background, I'm I've made my diagnosis. This is this is my typical absence. So I have my generalized background with events showing me absence with a normal background, my three or some spike and slow wave. Great, I, I made my diagnosis. This is a uh, um, this is typical absence seizures, and I start my ethosuximide or valproic acid. We'll talk about that here in a second. If I have a slow background, that's when I go and look at my generalized spike and wave. Is it truly three hertz, or, or is it uh, two and a half hertz or less? And after that, I need more workup because this is there's something not good here. Something that I need to look for underlying metabolic disorder, genetic disorder. I need to get an MRI. Remember in this, in this man, young man here, I did not get an MRI. I don't need to do anything else because I have normal development. I have my three hertz spike and wave. I got my, my seizure, I got my interactal three hertz spike and wave. I don't need to do MRI on this one here, but my slow background, or if I have uh, the atypical absence, that's when I need to get my MRI and that's when I need to get my genetic and metabolic and so forth. Okay. What if my EG shows me focal? And I, I think we talked about that with one of my, one, one, with Dr. Um, Amani's patient. I have focal findings in the EG that might become bilaterally synchronous. And again, we care about how the seizure starts and we care about how the EG starts, not how it ends. Everything can become secondary generalized or secondary bilateral synchronous, but we care about how did it start. So if it starts focal, it, I'm gonna have to ask myself one or two questions. Did I have events with that focal? If I have events that's focal, then I have my answer. It is a focal epilepsy. It is not a generalized epilepsy, even if, my clinical feature is absence-like. If I have focal, I treat it as focal seizure. I start my, my, my um, uh, oxcarbazepine or start my, my treatment. I'm not starting the generalized absence or the, general, the typical absence treatment here. In that patient, I need to find a cause. So MRI, maybe genetic and metabolic, depending on the development and depending on the background, depending on other things. But I need more workup in this young man because I need something else. If I don't capture events, still there's something that that I didn't completely resolve. So I need more workup. I need to get the MRI. I need to get my genetic and metabolic to find out why do I have a focal finding, even if I did not capture events. And that's someone that I consider getting a prolonged EEG on or an epilepsy monitoring study to be able to tell what's exactly happening. I need to capture those events to tell what's up. But at least I know it's focal. 
it is not generalized. Sometimes I'm gonna get the EG and the EG is normal. EG normal with events, great, that's, that's behavior. So I have my events and the EG is normal, it does not change, then that's ADHD, it's autism, it's something else, it's not seizures. I need to treat it as something else, not as seizures. But sometimes I get the EG, the EG is normal and I did not capture events. That did not close the, the story because I can still have this. We all know that focal seizures can show up with a normal EEG. Can it still be absence? Less than 2%. Less than 2% of absence epilepsy will present with a normal EEG, even interictally. So if I have a normal EEG in someone who's having staring, there's a 98% chance this is not going to be uh, absence. It can still be a seizure, but it will be a focal seizure in this case, not a, not a generalized seizure. Observed EEG uh, and observed EMU to be able to tell if, my, if I have a, um, someone who has events happening um, five times a week and I get a normal EEG without any events. This is someone that I want to resolve the case and I probably will would, would do a prolonged EEG to know what's, what's happening here. Let's talk about treatment. I think as we discussed, under four years of age, I need to think of GLUT1. This is, this is an absolute must. Even if it's not GLUT1, I, I need to at least look for it. I need to do the spinal tap or I need to do the genetic testing because like we agreed, the early intervention can really lead to better outcome down the road. It's atypical absence. Um, it, then again, I need to do my metabolic workup or what's happening. For childhood absence and juvenile absence epilepsy and the cutoff is used to be 10 years of age. Now it's a little bit less because we see juvenile absence epilepsy, especially in girls because of early hormonal changes. We see it as early as eight years of age. Um, Still, your ethosuximide and valproic acid. I know there, there's a lot of controversy about valproic acid because it, oh, it can cause weight gain, polycystic ovary, and all the things we talked about. I have to weigh the benefit risk ratio. Ethosuximide is my first line of treatment for absence epilepsy, period. It's the same efficacy as valproic acid, but it's a much better tolerated. If I am not responding to ethosuximide, then valproic acid is a great treatment to, to come to, 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 to help um, answer that question. What about in the childbearing age? Um, I do not do, or we do not do valproic acid in childbearing age. So we can do lamotrigine, ethosuximide, uh, or ethosuximide, then lamotrigine, maybe levetiracetam in that case as a, as a third line treatment of label use. I have to be clear here because levetiracetam is not FDA approved for absence epilepsy. However, there's enough literature showing its efficacy in absence epilepsy, but someone obviously who is pregnant or in the, in the childbearing age, I will not give them uh, valproic acid. Okay, what about drug resistant? We, we come to a point that we have to admit that the patient is drug resistant. And as the name implies, if I'm drug resistant, my answer should not be drugs. And that's when I go to the drawing board. And I think Dr. Nermin did a phenomenal job really showing that with her patient that I need to go back to the drawing board. I need, what am I missing? I'm missing something here. So either something in the history that pointed me um, to a diagnosis I have not been thinking of. Let's go back and look at the mechanism of action. Am I really looking at my proper mechanism of action? Uh, I, I'm making sure that I'm not treating um, absence with carbamazepine, for example. I'm not treating absence with phenytoin and so forth. But also start to look at non-pharmacological um, uh, options. Um, I think I shared with you, um, about six months ago, I had a 17-year-old a who was referred to me because of uh, drug-resistant absence epilepsy. When I did the EEG on her, uh, and by the way, her, her video, I promise you, was 100% typical absence seizures, 100% typical absence seizures. The EEG, however, did have that focal, like Dr. Amani's patient, did have that focal lead. It was within 200 milliseconds. We did the MRI, the MRI was normal. We did stereotactic EEG, we found the focus, we, we excised this focus, actually we did a laser ablation for this focus. The patient has been seizure free now for the last five months. So my point here is sometimes what might seem and sound like an absence seizure, this is very, very unlikely. If I'm not responding to my usual treatment, I need to think of, could it be focal that I'm missing here? Ketogenic diet, like Dr. Namin shared um, in, in the GLUT1 transport deficiency, but also in the non-GLUT1 transport deficiency. If I have my typical absence, where about roughly 15% of them can become drug resistant, I need to think of um, uh, um, ketogenic diet, um, a vagus nerve stimulator, calosotomy only if they're having generalized tonic-clonic or atonic seizures or myoclonic, something along with, that, with the absence or atypical absence with them. 
I can think of some other uh, 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 types as well. I'm gonna show very briefly some mimickers. So um, this is the mimicker. So notice how focal that starts. Actually, that's that's the 17 year old I was telling you about. So see, it starts very focal. You see that moderate voltage beta activity that leads into this bilaterally synchronous discharge. So that's a focal seizure that goes into generalized. Notice that bifrontal. So it starts bifrontal uh, seizure that leads into this generalized um, activity and into this slow, slow spike. And even in between, you see this um, fast activity in the bifrontal area. Look at this alternating. So it can actually be left or right. So this is another patient that would have absence, but it would start sometimes on the right, other times a little bit on the left. So this is um, uh, right or left. And in this case, it is generalized. It is not anything but generalized absence epilepsy. Notice how the posterior dominant rhythm will, uh, uh, will uh, I'm sorry, the, how this is posteriorly predominant. And so this is with your Javon. Typically, the absence epilepsy will be frontal predominant. Um, Javon syndrome is very notorious for being posterior. So notice here, this is my, my 18 hertz photic stimulation. And notice how it's generalized. It actually, it starts posteriorly and it starts building up into this three hertz generalized posterior predominant um, sharp and slow wave activity. So this is with your Javon syndrome. The post cyclic slowing, which we talked about with atypical absence, that's another feature. So as the seizure ends right here, you start having this post ictal slowing, which is something that you typically see um, in those patients. I'm gonna skip that video for the sake of time here. But in that young man, I wanna highlight that this is another focal that led to this bilateral synchrony here. Um, and it continue, continues going that way. So um, as we're looking at absence epilepsy, the questions that we have to answer, did I take the good history? Did I interpret the EG along with the history? I cannot look at only the EG and make the diagnosis, and I cannot look only at the history and the, and the video of the patient and make the diagnosis. I have to combine both together. Once I know I am in the typical absence or the absence of my clonic seizures, um, my ethosuximide, and by the way, even if the patient has generalized clinic, clinic yes, Peter Kellaway, Eli Mizrahi, and Richard Rockaby back in 1985, way, way back, they published this, this paper that patients who had generalized clinic, clinic with their absence, ethosuximide continued to control both. I know there is a notion sometimes that as, as the patient develops generalized clinic, clinic we switch them from ethosuximide over to, to valproic acid, and we don't need to do that. We just need to adjust and maximize my ethosuximide. If I maximize ethosuximide and the patient continues to have seizures, that's a different story. But if my patient is having breakthrough generalized tonic clonic, all what I need to do is simply just adjust my ethosuximide and that's gonna take care of it. I do not need to, to switch to valproic acid. And I repeat, I do not need to switch to valproic acid if I have room to go up on my ethosuximide. So once again, I really would like to thank the uh, organizing committee for a great, um, Symposium. Uh, I really like to thank Dr. Raib for the invitation and for 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 uh, his great work. Um, I'm really honored to be to be part of this group. I like to thank Dr. Nermin and Dr. Amani and everybody who really worked very hard in this great symposium. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ahmed, for this uh, very nice and very concentrated and informative, uh, intelligent lecture. Uh, now we will shift to the, the time remain and to questions and answer. I think we have uh, a lot of uh, questions, I think. Uh, I will read some for you. Uh, why sometimes the arrest of behavior happens later, one to two seconds after the discharge of spike and wave started? Should be, it should be synchronous? Or yeah. Not? Typically, it should be synchronous. Um, sometimes it's the perception of the arrested behavior. Uh, if we're talking about typical absons here. So if we're talking about typical absons, um, it, usually it's exactly happening at the same time. A lot of times, um, as the kid is doing something like watching television or playing with a toy in their hand or something like that, as they're doing that, it might seem <clears throat> that there's a lag. But once the generalized spike and wave starts in a typical absent, that's when the arrested behavior happens. If there's a lag, that typically happens more with the atypical absence. If there's a little bit of a lag, that's more for the atypical absence, not for the typical absence. But with typical absence, you should see that arrested behavior exactly as the as the generalized spike and wave happens. Yes, but so I have one point is that the uh, the the absence may be defined as behavior arrest of behavior, but uh, behavior of arrest not necessarily is an absence. 
a seizure, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it may be other type of seizures. It is a special type even of seizure. Uh, that time, it may be uh, not very abrupt with the uh, with the EEG, where it is not a typical, uh, uh, I think, uh, typical uh, absence. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, what your final diagnosis? My clonic absence is one of possible syndromes for case two. Um, I don't remember what case two was. Uh, I, I do think it that. was uh, my my clonic uh, absence epilepsy. It was. Yeah, I, I I believe we had we had that case. I, I don't remember if it was. I, I believe it was case two. So yes, um, absence my clonic epilepsy. I don't answer the, the, I understand the question. What's your final diag diagnosis? My clonic absence is one of possible syndromes for case two. Yeah, it, it was the it was, it was my clonic absence epilepsy. Yeah, 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 I agree. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, why not Dravet syndrome because of history of prior seizures? There oh, are, okay. Another question, not not mine. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So let's let's so Dravet syndrome or severe myoclonic epilepsy of infancy (SMEI). Um, it's a sodium channelopathy that typically happens within the first year of life. Typically, it starts with uh, seizure associated fever, which might be initially perceived as febrile seizures. Um, but the patient will continue to have those seizures, will continue to have the mainly myoclonic seizure, as the name implies. Remember, Dravet is severe myoclonic epilepsy of infancy. So myoclonic seizure is the, is the main um, uh, uh, syndrome. Now, that's exactly what we were talking about. I have to put everything in, 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 in context together. So my Dravet syndrome patient can have um, epileptic spasms. They usually will have myoclonic seizure, myoclonic epilepsy. But as the story developed, we have atypical absence. We have the glute one, which is, again, that, that's, that's a slam dunk. So and another patient with febrile seizure that continues to have febrile and non-febrile seizures. Of course, I, I should be thinking of Dravet syndrome, but not every case that starts with febrile seizure should, should be Dravet syndrome. I keep it in the back of my mind, but not always the case, not always the final diagnosis. Another question from Dr. Hula. Thanks for this very nice interactive section, session. I have some patient with typical childhood absence epilepsy uh, doing well and seizure free. When I try to stop the treatment, uh, regain the steering attacks and regain free when readmit the treatment. Yeah. So when do we stop seizure um, treatment for patients with absence epilepsy? So typically, um, here are the thing. I want a patient to be at least two years seizure free, number one. Number two, before I stop the medicine, I need to obtain um, an EEG that includes sleep for the following reasons. So I need to include active and quiet sleep because I will stop the medicine only if the interictal activity disappears from the awake, from the REM sleep, and 15% will persist in the quiet phase sleep. In that case, I am good to start, to start with the medication. A lot of times, I only can control the clinical symptoms, but the electrographic activity is happening. How do I know that? If I have any interictal activity in wakefulness or in REM sleep, the patient is not ready to, to stop the medication. Even if they've been seizure-free for five years, I need to repeat that EEG to be able to tell if I'm, if I'm doing good or not. After I stop the EEG, I'm sorry, after I stop the medications and an absence epilepsy patient, there's about a 30% chance patients will come back with, with seizures and epilepsy. How do I know? There's no way to know, but as long as my EEG is normal, or at least does not show interactive activity in awake and REM sleep, and sometimes I need to admit the patient overnight, uh, to, to be able to get to the REM sleep, unless I'm going to keep him in my lab for like two hours to get to the REM sleep, um, that, that's, that's usually a very good clue. But being seizure-free by itself is not a good indicator to stop the medicine. I need to make sure that I got rid of the interactive activity from both awake and uh, REM sleep. It is okay to, to have it in, in non-REM quiet sleep. Uh, that will continue to happen for the rest of their lives in about 15% of the patients. Another question, can we see dry uh, trunk clinic in childhood absence of epilepsy? 100%, and actually in about 20% of the patients. So um, 20, one out of five kids with childhood absence epilepsy K2 
can have a generalized tonic clonic. A lot of times, actually, that's the very first clue to the family or the very first cue that the kid has been having absence seizure for the last year. Nobody's been paying attention to it until the kid has his first generalized tonic clonic. And everybody, of course, now is, is afraid and everybody is concerned. And that's when they come to the neurology clinic. That's when we do the EG. And that's when we find that, oh, you have absence epilepsy and you're one of the lucky 20% that will have generalized tonic clonic. Yes. Uh, for that point, I just want to mention something that it is in childhood absence epilepsy, we usually uh, find the generalized tonic clonic after the absence seizures, never before the absence seizures. Once they come before the absence seizures, uh, then it may be exclusive for, for childhood absence epilepsy. It usually, usually come, uh, always comes after the absence seizure. Uh, it may then, then be some say, say of juvenile absence epilepsy. Right, right. So, so uh, again, so the hallmark of any absence seizure will be absence seizure. Oh, I'm sorry, the hallmark of any absence epilepsy will be absence seizure. Yes, sir. that's going to be the hallmark. That's going to be the main feature, and that's exactly why they will have first absence seizures. Then later on, they can have generalized tonic clonic. Yes, what I meant is sometimes the patient, the family will miss the absence that's been happening until the generalized tonic clonic happens. That's when everybody now pays attention. Yes, but in childhood absence epilepsy, usually the absence is the usual. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, well, absolutely, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, other question, is there an EEG difference between childhood absence and uh, juvenile absence epilepsy? The EEG short wise. answer is no. The short answer is no, because both will show the, the three hertz spike and slow wave. In juvenile absence epilepsy, about um, over 50% of them will have the polyspike and wave, uh, but that's not a hard rule. So you can absolutely have a juvenile absence epilepsy that will only be spike or sharp and slow wave, and you might have a childhood absence epilepsy that might be polyspike and wave, but overall, it is more likely to see the polyspike and wave in the juvenile absence epilepsy than you've seen in the childhood, but it, that's not a hard rule. You can see, they can look very similar. Because remember, please remember this, you always want to put everything in context. I cannot only take the video alone, the history alone, or the EG alone. Everything has to make sense altogether. Plus, uh, Neidermeyer, in his uh, com comprehensive book about uh, EEG, uh, he said that uh, there are some difference, uh, uh, you know, uh, that about uh, between childhood and juvenile, and that is in uh, childhood absence epilepsy, usually the EEG, the three cycle per second, is a clean one, clean one, while the EEG in uh, ju juvenile absence as you know, it's a complex say, there are body spikes, there are sometimes uh, focal alternating on right and left. It's not clean as, as that. But I, I, I really agree with you that practically speaking, there is no difference, uh, practically speaking. But it is said uh, that there is some difference in, uh, in th that uh, way. Well, uh, if I have... Um, uh, regarding EEG, what is the duration between focal discharge and bilateral synchronous discharge to be defined as secondary bilateral synchrony and not combined focal and generalized discharge? Yeah, so it can be as little as 200 milliseconds, which is one line on your EEG. That's all what it needs to take, 200 milliseconds, which is a fifth of a second. Um, that's good enough for it to be focal with bilateral synchrony. Uh, and I think the the shape of the bilateral synchrony should be very similar to the uh, the vocal start. Uh, right. And I, I I noticed that the secondary bilateral synchrony is usually evolved to be uh, uh, to be a slow spike and wave later on. So it is not. It's, I I never find a, a, a secondary bilateral synchrony with typical three cycles per second at the end. I mean. While on the progress of the EEG, yeah, it is, it's, 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 it is uh, slow spike and wave, and similar to what we see in Lennox Gast. Yeah, so that, that's a, that's an important point, but I would caution um, using that as its only sign because if the seizure is short, uh, five seconds or four seconds, it might not make it all the way to become uh, two and a half hertz. In other terms, any typical absence seizure. If it becomes long, and I think I showed you some of those examples, it starts losing speed 
So later on, at like after 10 seconds or so, it might become a little bit two and a half or even two hertz spike in wave. That does not make it atypical. By the same token, an atypical absence, if it's only short, it can um, be, I'm sorry, if, if it's a bilateral synchrony, it can from the beginning be three hertz spike in wave if it's only short, um, if it's not long. I agree 100% with you. If I take two 20 second seeders, one typical and one atypical, it is more likely for the atypical to, to lose the speed and to become a little bit slow spike, slow wave. But I caution because if I have a shorter seizure, I don't want that to be the deciding point for me here. Yes, but the, always we find the shape of the three second by second is something characteristic. Uh, it's not easily, uh, you know, mimicked by the secondary bilateral synchrony, uh, practically speaking. Right. I mean, the second bilateral synchrony will always be preceded by the spike, so the morphology will be different, and definitely the distribution will be different. Absolutely. Well, uh, uh, another question. Thank you for the previous answer. We had more absences recorded in the same EEG, all with a three high spike and wave, but some with synchronous behavior arrest, others behavior arrest, few seconds, three hertz spike wave started, and others able to say the memory word should be diagnosed as typical or atypical absence. Thank you so much for inter uh, interesting topic. Yeah, that, that's actually, that's a very common thing that happens. Um, and I would really like to point your attention. If you go back to that EEG and you look, we have a number of things that can happen on, a, on an absence epilepsy patient. We can have the, the fragmentary burst that we talked about. We can have abortive spike and wave. So if I have two or three abortive generalized spike and wave, abortive means it's a single one. It is not a frequency. So just a one generalized frontal, frontal dominant high voltage spike and slow wave. If I have two or three of those back to back, it might look like I have a three hertz spike and wave while in reality, the patient will regain back the background right in between before they go into the seizure. So in a patient with absence epilepsy, there should be, and I'm talking typical absence epilepsy, there should be 100% synchrony between your actual ictal, ictal EEG, three hertz spike and wave and your clinical behavioral arrest. What happens that can cause confusion sometimes is that you're going to have two or three abortive discharges right before the seizure. So you think that the seizure started, but how do I know the difference? Um, the frequency is going to be a little bit off, number one. Number two, you might get a little bit of a background, can be as small as a half a second where you get back to the background before the seizure actually starts. So if you have an example, I'd love to show you what I'm talking about here, but this is not an atypical thing. This is a very common um, uh, um mistake that sometimes we will make uh, as we're looking at the abortives, but counting them as part of the seizure. Uh, another question, is there special situations can provide seizures in absence epilepsy? I have some women with typical absences have tonic, clonic seizure with menses and pairs. Yeah, it is a huge a question. Yeah, so two things here. Um, if we're talking about absence epilepsy, as we discussed, 100%, absolutely. Yes, patients can have generalized tonic clonic. The other thing too, which we have to remember, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy can have absence seizures, which also can have generalized tonic clonic seizures. So not every absence seizure patient is an absence epilepsy patient um, and vice versa. So I just wanna make sure that I clarify that, that yes, the absence epilepsy patient can have generalized tonic clonic seizures and other types of epilepsy can have absence seizures with it. Well, I think this is the end of the uh, uh, questions in front of mine and really, and we come to the possibly the, the end of the time. We thank you very much, uh, Professor Ahmed for this nice uh, uh, lecture and for those nice answers and uh, uh, this activity really is interesting by your uh, attendance really. Uh, thank you for Dr. Professor Nermeen and her uh, uh, team for the preparation of such interesting uh, activity. We hope we'll continue these activities uh, in the future. I think we will have three or four in this year. Hope uh, Professor Ahmed will be again our uh, guest in the future. Uh, Dr. Nermeen, if you want to say something to thank Dr. Ahmed. No, just I, 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 will, uh, I, will, I would 
like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Ahmed very much for uh, kind uh, um, acceptance of uh, the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Ghaif, for this discussion. Thank you for attendees. Thank you. Thank you thank very you much. much. Thank, thank you. you. See you. See you soon. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.